Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined today by Christopher Bartell, who is Professor of Philosophy at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, awesome. So we're talking about your book, which I have right here, which the mm -hmm. light, okay, the glare is coming there out is. there. There we go. So video games, violence, and the ethics of fantasy. I just read that title backwards. I'm impressed with myself. Proud of you. Uh, which which came out uh, in 2020 from Bloomsbury, um, which uh, I really, really, really enjoyed this book, as I've told you uh, previously. Well, this is such a fun book and such a fantastic topic. And I guess the place to start is just the very basic question of what problem or problems motivated you to write the book cool okay thanks um the the longer version of the story is that the whole process of writing the book began with this like stunning moment of arrogance on my part <laughs> it was um it was about 10 or so years ago i was revising a class um i wanted to include a section of my class on video games and I just started reading around of like what kind of cool stuff is out there on video games and I stumbled across um, Morgan Luck's essay The Gamer's Dilemma um, and I fell in love with that I was like I was just so impressed by like what a clear interesting problem it was and the stunning moment of arrogance was I immediately thought I can solve this problem so I wrote an essay and I sent it off and it got published and I, I washed my hands of it. I thought, yep, there I did. I just solved a problem. Um, and then I started seeing criticisms of my essay and, and um, particularly Stephanie Patridge's um, essay critiquing mine kind of point. It, it really hit home that like, oh, I did, I did not solve that problem. Um, so I, I then realized that it, it needed, I wanted to go back to that topic and I needed to, I thought that I was just going to write a response essay, um, but I realized that I had a lot more to say. I was really super surprised that I had a lot more to say. I'm, I'm not the kind of person who tends to have book-sized thoughts. I tend to have essay-sized thoughts. Um, so I was thrilled that I had a book-sized thought um, and here it is. So the basic... Um, problem that I began with in the book is that concern about violence in video games has been around for decades, right? And a lot of that has been, um, there's been loads of work by psychologists and social scientists on the relationship between violence in games and real world violence. Um, that is not what my book is about. It's not about the relationship between violence in games and real world violence. Instead, what I do is I accept the whole I accept that that debate is a stalemate, right? I accept that there isn't really strong evidence either way. Um, but nonetheless, philosophers, we shouldn't worry about what the evidence says because there are still interesting moral issues that we can think about. Um, instead of focusing on the relationship between real world violence and video game violence, I'm more interested in, there seem to be some games that are beyond the pale. Right. Um, when I teach my ethics, my um, philosophy and video games class, and we start talking about violence in games, the students always, always come up with the most boring examples of violence in games. And what I mean is they come up with their examples of violence in games are Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. And I, I like to, you know, make a point to the students that in terms of violence, they ain't shit. There's games out there that are way, way darker. There are rape video games that are, there are pedophilia video games. There are torture video games. There are white supremacist video games. And, the, you know, I don't kind of, I kind of don't care what the evidence, <laughs> that's a terrible thing to say. I kind of don't care what the evidence shows about the relationship between real world violence and, you know, video game violence. I feel like there's something morally, problematic about the games that are beyond the pale um so the whole issue of the book kind of begins as like a version of the gamer's dilemma um really quickly uh for people who don't know it the gamer's dilemma is um this idea that 
when we typically try to defend violence in video games, the common inference that people get or the common argument that people give is there can't be anything wrong with me committing murder in a, in a game because nobody is actually harmed. Um, but then Morgan Luck points out, and this is, I think, the whole point of his essay, Gamer's Dilemma, he points out that that inference, because nobody's actually harmed, is a generalizable inference, right? If you can do X in a game because nobody's actually harmed, well, I can defend not only murder in games, but also pedophilia in games because nobody's harmed, right? It's a video game character. So that's the issue that the whole book begins with. Um, there's a, a game called um, Ethnic Cleansing. It's a white supremacist video game. Um, in, in the game, your job, you're playing as a white race warrior and your job is to massacre as many black, Hispanic and Jewish people as you can in the game. And I, I don't care if it's just a game, right? That, that's beyond the pale. That seems like there's something, even if the player never acts on what they do in the game, that still seems to me something wrong. And that's what I'm trying to explain. Um, the default position would be this kind of like general amoralism that there can't be anything wrong because it's just a game or because it's just a work of fiction. Um, and I, I just feel like the amoralist position sounds real, real hollow when we're talking about a game like ethnic cleansing. Um, so that's what the task of the book is. It's to try to explain when it's morally wrong to do something in a game and why it's morally wrong to do something in a game, even though nobody's actually harmed. Okay, cool. So let's start with the win question, right? When is it wrong to engage in immoral behavior in games? Because as you mentioned, you know, Grand Theft Auto, you know, you're just allowed within the game to just murder people on the sidewalk, right? Yeah. Just go on a killing spree. And as long as you get away from the cops and can like cool things off, like you can go off and do it again. Mm -hmm. And why is that sort of, activity in a game not as problematic as other sorts of things like like torture etc et mm -hmm. um a, a, an unintuitive um idea that i'm i try to make in the book i don't know that i make it strongly enough um it, it's sort of an unintuitive idea but i mean this um the content of what you're doing in the game actually isn't important what matters more than the content of what you're doing is your attitude towards it. Um, it's morally wrong to do something in a game when the player feels like what they're doing in the game is an expression of their own values or an expression of their own will. Um, I've been playing games for a really long time. You know, my parents bought me an Atari 2600 in the early 80s and when I think about the number of things that I've killed in games over the past, I don't know how many decades, it's in the, you know, the hundreds of thousands of things that I've killed in games. Um, and I don't really feel bad about that because when, when I'm playing a game most of the time, and like most players, um, when I'm playing a game, I see it as a challenge. I see it as a puzzle. I see it as... Um, an interesting, you know, piece of entertainment to divert myself with for a while. But yeah, I don't think of it that, I don't think of it as being really, you know, indicative of my desires, my goals, my values, my beliefs, um, except for sometimes when it does happen. And it does happen sometimes that I, I come across a, a thing in a game that I don't want to do. Um, when that happens, I then have this choice to make that I can either keep playing, I can push through the thing that I don't want to do, um, or I can turn the game off or whatever it might be. Um, I find it so interesting how many players won't turn a game off when a game pushes you into doing something that you're uncomfortable with. Um, and I think a lot of players, and that's for complicated reasons, right? You might be having a, a really fun aesthetic experience overall. So you push yourself through this one part of the game that you're uncomfortable with. Um, or it might be that you, you trust the game designer enough that they're going to do something relevant with this complex thing. Like an example of that is, um, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, um, the very first opening sequence of the game 
um, you have to play as an undercover agent who is infiltrating a terrorist cell and the terrorist cell has decided to go to an airport and massacre a whole bunch of civilians. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to go along with it, right? You can't blow your cover. So you go to this airport and you just massacre civilians. Call of Duty players, when that game was released, were, were blown away by that because that was totally new for the Call of Duty franchise. Um, but, you know, a lot of players pushed themselves through that scene because they trusted the game developers. They trust that Call of Duty is a good game franchise that they, you know, have this strong connection to. So they assume, well, this must be for a reason. So they go through the bad thing that they don't want to do for some reason. Um, there are other cases where I do turn the game off, where a game asks me to do something that, or, you know, presents me with something that I'm uncomfortable with. And I decide, you know, this isn't the game for me. And I end up turning it off. Um, the last game that did that to me was Nier Automata. Um, and the reason for it wasn't because of any action that I did in the game. The reason for it was because the avatar is this like super sexy manga character wearing this tiny little short skirt. And every time she walks up a ladder, the, the camera pans up and I'm upskirting her. And, you know, my 10 year old daughter walks into the room and I feel like I'm a creepy old, you know, middle aged man playing this game where I'm upskirting a character all the time. So I turned that one off. Um, so, gosh, this is a long answer. When is it morally wrong to do something bad in a game? Um, the answer is when you're doing it because it speaks to your values, because um, it's when you're doing something in a game, not because the game prompts you to do it, but you're doing something in a game because you really want to see it done. That's when it becomes problematic. So your account is somewhat expressivist in that sense, right? That the actions you're performing are an expression of your values or commitments or beliefs or desires, right? Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't put it into the language of expressivism, but I, I, I could see you put it that way. I'm taking this from Harry Frankfurt's compatibilist account of free will, where he says that there's a difference between your will to action and your your freedom to act and your freedom to will, right? So Frankfurt thinks that you can be committed to doing some kind of action, but you don't feel like that action is an expression of you. And weirdly, you know, I don't know if that's a good explanation of free will in the real world, but uh, you know, I do recognize the experience that Frankfurt is talking about. It's those times when a person does something and you feel like this is uncharacteristic of me, or I feel like I'm being caught in the tide and I'm just going along with the flow of, I'm just going with the crowd or something like that. That kind of thing happens, sure. Um, what I find more interesting is that it really is a good explanation of what, ha what happens in video games, right? Video games are very deterministic. Um, I'm often coerced into doing various things in the game that I don't elect myself but i go along with it because that's the game um and sometimes i feel like i'm just doing this because that's the game and other times i feel like i'm doing this because i really want to see this done right this matters to me those are the cases that become morally interesting those are the cases that kind of speak to elements of our moral character yeah right and so there there's a difference between someone who you know reaches a particular moment in a game where like this this problematic moral choice is is put forward and the choice is your character in the game is doing something straightforwardly immoral mm -hmm. that you are deeply uncomfortable with maybe mm -hmm. right and and so there there's or that most people would be deeply uncomfortable with let's you say you would hope yeah right yeah and so there there's a difference between uh the player who just decides to shut the game off right just like nope i'm out versus the character who's like or the, rather the player who's like begrudgingly going along with it because they have beliefs about you know the the game designer and they trust them or mm -hmm. at any rate they think okay this may be an interesting story i want to see how this plays out versus the person who's like finally right <laughs> i get a chance to do this thing that you know i've been fantasizing about exactly yeah, yeah. Grand Theft Auto V, there's a scene in the game where you have to torture um, uh, you have to torture somebody to get information out of them. Um, 
And Grand Theft Auto is a well-loved franchise that I can imagine lots of players who are uncomfortable with the idea of torturing somebody to get information out of them, but you go along with it because it's Grand Theft Auto, because you love the series. You know that it's largely satirical. You know that they often try to make a point with the the things that they do. But yeah, but on the other hand, imagine the player who's like, finally, I get to torture someone. I've always wanted to waterboard someone. Yes. And then... Even worse, they keep replaying that scene in the game over and over again. They stop the game and restart from an earlier save point to do it again because it's so good. Yeah, that freaks me out. Right. And so let's just start with like the, the first difference, right? Between the person who decides, nope, I'm out versus the person who begrudgingly goes along with it, right? Is the person who begrudgingly go, who decides to begrudgingly go along with it are they criticizable morally in any way for deciding to go along with it? That Okay, so are they criticizable in any way? I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe there are some interesting cases where they would be criticizable in some way. Broadly speaking, I'm willing to let that person off the hook. Um, because broadly speaking, if they're if they're begrudgingly going along with it, what's what's important for me is that the action isn't something that resonates with them that it occurred to me um a while ago that the the games that i play the most of tend to be high fantasy rpgs and i don't know why but that's something about my personality that you know this is a kind of fantasy that really speaks to me something about the high fantasy rpg world that you know that somehow captures something I care about or some value or some desire for me. I don't know what it is, but I really like that genre. I really don't like shooter games that they're just not that interesting to me. Um, so the player who begrudgingly goes along with something, I mean, I, I think that games generally kind of, they do, we're, we're attracted to the games that reflect something to us about the kind of person that I want to be or beliefs that I hold, or um, the way that I see the world, or values, whatever it might be. Um, a lot of the students in my classes tend to be hardcore Call of Duty players. And I find it so interesting with the hardcore Call of Duty players that a lot of them seem to have this like fantasy of being a soldier that they're tied up in. And the game speaks to their values. It's very mil militaristic. It's very jingoistic. It's very, you know, they love the rah-rah masculinity of it. Yeah, it, it really captures something that they value. And there are lots of players that can't play the Call of Duty games for exactly that reason. It's not because it's a badly designed game or I just don't like shooter games, but that it's the rah-rah masculinity and the hyper, you know, um, valid, uh, valorization of it that seems really off-putting to attractive to some players but off-putting to others yeah and i mean outside of video games you can have you know people who are turned off by football for precisely being militaristic and jingoistic in a way that baseball is just like yeah. not that and basketball isn't like that whereas football right. is very much there blitzes right it's all very like <laughs> militaristic and it, it's nature how we conceive of it right and so you can imagine a lot of like Call of Duty players also preferring football over other sports, at least in terms of viewership. But that's interesting too, that would, right? The That would be an interesting um, correlation to look for. But anyways, yeah. Yeah, good. There's your X-Fi hat, <laughs> putting that on, right? Um, uh, yeah, and I mean, it's interesting too that as you put it, they're, they're, you know, Call of Duty players, or at least hardcore ones, are are playing into a fantasy of being a soldier, even if, you know, they ain't joining up in the military, right? They're not joining like a mercenary squad. But yeah. could, so could you, I mean, the, the book is about fantasy, right? In yeah. a lot of respects, right? That are fantasies when we engage in gameplay. And so can you talk about that side of the account you're giving in the book? Sure. Um, I'll begin with um, uh, just an anecdote about what you previously said. Um, there was a student in one of my classes who was this hardcore Call of Duty, you know, bro, um, and we, I forget what we were talking about, but um, it, it, this has to do with the whole, you know, the fantasy aspect of the game. Um, and the student was getting really upset with me about, you know, 
the the topic of the conversation and he insisted like i play call of duty all the time and i i kill people all day long and that doesn't make me a bad person right the inference that he's doing is the you know i do this but it doesn't make me that and i pointed out to him yeah and it doesn't make you a soldier or a hero either and his face just sunk he was just like how could you say that i've been playing call of duty for a decade of course i'm a hero and it was like no kid this is a weird fantasy that you're caught up in right um, but that's, I found that so interesting that, that, you know, people get drawn into certain games because of the fantasies that they, they want the game to give them. Um, so uh, the, the big question is why would it be wrong to engage in a fantasy? Um, especially as I'm not hurting anybody and this is all just, it just happens in my head. W what's the problem then? Who's, you know, how could this be wrong? Um, Obviously, like in a consequentialist sense, there's nothing wrong because there are no real world consequences. Um, in a Kantian deontological sense, there's nothing wrong either because when I'm killing video game characters, they're not human. They don't deserve human respect and they don't have dignity and autonomy. They're, they're automatons. Um, virtue ethics gives us a really interesting answer. Um, the answer is that I could be harming myself if acting out these fantasies is a way of me cultivating a ver uh, cultivating a, a vice instead of a virtue. Um, and that, I mean, I think it's really interesting if you look at gaming communities that I, I don't know that there's direct evidence for games helping people cultivate vices, right? But I think there is direct evidence that a whole bunch of gaming communities are fucking toxic um they're not very magnanimous right Magna magnanimity is not one of the virtues of being a hardcore you know esports gamer and i i wonder if that's you know that's part of the culture of the game it's part of the culture of the esports community is that right you have to behave a certain way this really like hyper masculine performance of being a troll is widely accepted um it, it so you get to the the interesting virtue ethical question of like is this a good way of is this a good life is this a good way to lead to you know live the good life um and maybe it isn't maybe there are things that are lacking maybe um you know developing my hyper masculine troll tendencies isn't a good way for me to you know have true friendships or become magnanimous or um you know it, it I don't know if it's a if it counts as a vice, but it sounds pretty close. Um, the basic argument in the book is that um, by willingly doing uh, vicious things in a game, what I'm doing is I'm giving it, I'm feeding immoral desires that I have, and I'm cultivating a taste for those desires. I'm getting better at. Um, finding the the content that I like and and um, developing character traits that tend towards that sort of content. Um, so it's morally wrong for me to do something violent in a game when doing so uh, helps to cultivate an immoral desire. That's the the big argument in the in chapter five. Yeah, right. And for you know, according to your review, that would be true even if you were never in the real world to act on those desires, right? Yeah, that that exactly. you are deforming your moral character, and that's that's the harm, right? That's the bad thing that's happening. It's not necessarily that, uh, you know, you can be uh, online playing games, being as misogynistic mm -hmm. as you want in in the world of the game, and then just behave normally toward women in real life but the problem is the harm you're doing to yourself yeah uh, not and it's you know as you said it's not consequentialist right it's not oh you're cultivating these ways of thinking and 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 you know and attitudes you and, and desires yeah. right and it's not that you're going to act on them and harm people it's no no the harm is located inside of you yeah and you i mean th there is a good question of like what still though what would be the harm um, if I'm a, you know, hardcore gamer troll online, but I don't act that way in reality, what's the problem? And I think the problem is this interesting, you know, that kind of person has to have um, a kind of a personality that that comes apart in pieces, right? It's, it's 
you have a part of you that you behave a certain way in this context and another part of you that behaves in another way in another context and these you're not a holistic person right um it requires my being able to um, keep these two parts of my life separate at all times. That sounds like a lot of work. It sounds um, disappointing. It sounds depressing. It sounds like it would be a hard psychological task to go through. And I, I doubt that people are particularly good at it either. Um, so yeah, there you go. Yeah, right. And I mean, further, the distinction between behaving online versus behaving in the real world, like, that's not a sharp distinction at all, right? I, um, I'm getting increasingly more interested in technology ethics stuff. And yeah. I kind of wonder, I, I really believe that we, you know, who work in aesthetics um, might have something to contribute to technology ethics stuff because I, I'm interested in the idea that maybe um, a lot of problems that we find with online behaviors comes from the fact that people have like really weird confused ideas about the concept of fiction and the idea that because I'm doing something digitally online it it's not real enough in some kind of way um I haven't explored that thought very very deeply but that's that's something I'm interested in, in doing next yeah, yeah yeah that's awesome and I mean further just to go back a bit right the the issue that you raised of you know when we think about playing video games, often, at least as outsiders, we think of, oh, it's just a person by themselves playing. But mm -hmm. as you're pointing out, this is something that's done in communities, right? That you could play mm -hmm. online with other people, sometimes lots and lots of other people in like Warcraft and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, further, you can belong to various like chat rooms and other forms of communities that can very much exacerbate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, toxic tendencies you may have that you can, mm -hmm. you know, allow those to become like, that's just who I am now, right? Is yeah. like, I was slightly misogynistic, but thanks to doing, you know, engaging in this particular community, like I'm now full on like QAnon and, and full on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a full yeah. on misogynist, white supremacist, et cetera. Um, do, you, do you play any online stuff? Have you had the joy of being cussed at by a 12 year old online? No, I haven't. <laughs> I know. No, I, I don't. I I tend to not play online stuff. A because I do have an addictive personality. I would get addicted, and B I don't want to get cussed at by twelve year olds. It's just I got other things going on. Yeah, right. And in a sense, the the gaming communities may be training those kids in in the way that you're describing to just become shitty adults. Right, that you're just mm -hmm. becoming a, a shitty person through the particularities of the community that you're engaging with and the norms and behaviors that are uh, licensed and, and applauded in, in those certain forms of, of uh, community, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's worth considering that um, the, the debate over violence in video games has long focused on the content of games. Um, I think it's worth considering that, you know, the content of the game isn't the thing that is um, really, a, really problematic it might be more so the gaming community right um it's not that call of duty is gonna make a, a you know a happy-go-lucky 12 year old into a terrorist right but the gaming community might the gaming community well not a terrorist but you know um really aggressive hyper masculine misogynist yeah that's that's totally a possibility Oy, yeah. And so um, I, I guess another question that sort of stems from this is to what extent are game designers and game developers and, and companies morally criticizable for putting players in a situation where you have to do something immoral, right? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, you know, like the developers of like the ethnic cleansing game you described, like, they're morally criticizable, but what about other forms of, of criticism towards game designers and developers and companies? Like, how can we yeah. criticize them morally or in what circumstances should we? The bulk of my book tends to, I'm mainly focused on players. I'm mainly, I put a lot of weight on the psychology and the motivation of the player. Um, and part of the reason for that is that sometimes players can co-opt a game in a way that the, that the game designer never intended. 
Um, for instance, I told you about the Call of Duty um, modern warfare airport massacre scene uh, a few minutes ago. Um, in Norway, the, the mass shooter Anders Breivik, um, he claimed during his um, testimony in court that he used to play that scene on a loop. He would play the airport massacre scene over and over again as a way of getting himself psyched up and ready for his own actual real world attack. Um, and obviously, like, that's a case of somebody co-opting the game to do something that the game designers didn't. Need. You know, if the game designers intended that opening sequence to present the player with, you know, here's what here's what a morally challenging situation in war really looks like, then that's fine. There's an interesting, you know, narrative aesthetic reason why the game designers put that in. But then this player co-opted it in a way that you know, A was unintended, B is creepy as hell. Um, so my account really focuses uh, most of the weight on the psychology of the player. That being said, I do think that game designers share some responsibility, um, at least in some cases. They, you know, they create scenarios or they employ images um, that enable players to um, to live out certain kinds of fantasies. Um, the uh, ethnic cleansing case is a bad case because it's so obvious, right? It's so obvious, like the game is actually published by um, a white supremacist record label. So there's no uncertainty about what the game is supposed to be doing. Um, another kind of case would be, uh, there's a game called Hatred. Have you ever heard of it? No, I haven't. So Hatred is a game where you, it's a first person shooter. Um, where you play as a a man who's just pissed off and what you're what you're able to do is just massacre as many people as you can in one night that's it that's the whole game there is no story there's no narrative to it there's no like moral payoff in the end um it it really is just a you you get to massacre as many people as you possibly can and it's really brutal it's it's a pretty gruesome game um I don't think, you know, the game developers for that could say, well, we intend it to be, you know, just a, a play, a, a way for players to let off some steam. Um, if anybody co-ops our game to actually live out some kind of fantasy, that's their problem. I, that sounds really shallow to me. I mean, the game developers can't pretend that they don't know how players will use it. Um, to that extent, I do think that game developers share some responsibility, particularly when they present scenarios or they use imagery that really narrows the range of what a player can imaginatively do with that content. If the only thing that you can imaginatively do with the content is really nasty, then surely the game de developers, um, you know, they have some responsibility there. Yeah. Right. And as you were talking, I was thinking, um, you know, we, we engage. So the difference between, video games and movies is video games or one difference is that video games are interactive, right? We are the character performing the actions, but we can sometimes get like vicarious thrills by sort of passively watching, uh, you know, particular movies. Right. And so I'm thinking of like the death wish series, right. Starring Charles Bronson. I love, love, love those movies. Charles Bronson even, is great. I know, but even though like the worldview presented in those films is right wing in a really problematic way yeah. to me. Right. Um, but I still enjoy them. Right. And so I think it's a case where, you know, I'm along for the ride. I'm just going to enjoy it. And it's not going to like penetrate like yeah. my worldview or my personality or my moral character. Whereas maybe the interactivity of video games, right. Allows you to, you know, not so much vicariously, I mean, although obviously it's not you, right? But like you're actively performing the immoral actions as opposed mm -hmm. to just witnessing them, even though they're fictional, right? Yeah. I didn't say this in the book, but I am kind of hopeful of the idea that the theory that I develop in the book is actually generalizable to other works of fiction, even, you know, passive fictions like movies. Um, so it's interesting. So when you're watching the Death, Death Wish movies, um, there's a certain amount of it that you have to let the movie roll off you, right? You don't, you don't internalize the whole, you know, story. 
You just let it roll off you. But imagine another viewer who is like, this is the world that I want to live in. This is the way that the world really is. And that's how I see politics. Then for that player, for that viewer, there's something psychologically going on that you can, you can criticize and ask like, well, maybe you shouldn't watch that movie, right? Maybe this is helping you cultivate a part of your personality that you ought not to. Sorry, my microphone was off. That's okay. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, the, and, and that's, you know, the issue with, with violent video games as they're discussed in the media, right. It, it's the video game's fault, right? Well, yeah. no, that antecedently, there's something like off with you, uh, morally and you're using it perhaps as a way to just reaffirm the badness that's already there yeah. to help it, help foster it, help enable it. I mean, here's another example, um, you know, and maybe this brings the two lines of thought together here. Um, there's a Japanese video game called Battle Raper. Um, it's a Mortal Kombat style game where, you you know, you're um, beating two opponents, beating each other up. When you hit a female opponent, her clothes fall off. And when you finally um, defeat her in battle, you have the player has the option to rape her. Pretty wild. Um, in that kind of case, I think that the game developer surely has some moral responsibility here because, you know, the scenarios and the images they're presenting really narrows the range of what the player can imagine. You can't pretend, you know, imaginatively pretend that something else is going on here. It is exactly what you're seeing on the screen. Um, but you're right, like... For a really long time, the debate over violence in games has focused on the content of the game and the game developer and what the game is. I think it's equally as relevant to look at the game player and really ask, why do you want to play that? Like, of all the things out there, why is it that Battle Raper is the game that you're like, that's what I want in my Christmas stocking? I, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, I think on that note, actually, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> um, you so can kick me out now. That's no, no, okay. No. So <laughs> here's something you might want in your Christmas stocking. Um, yeah. Video <laughs> Games, Violence, and the Ethics of Fantasy uh, by Chris Bartell. Um, Chris, thank you so much for joining me. This was a really, really fun discussion. Sure. Thanks for having me.